this session. Uh, Stephen Gilbert from the University of Dresden. And if I'm not mistaken, so we save time, so I make a little introduction so you can set up your uh, equipment. Uh, well, if you could reduce a little, that would be fine, but I, I would leave it up to you to see if it fits in there. So, um, we, yeah, so, we, so we've actually met two or three weeks ago in London at a, at a, at a conference of digital biomarkers, and in a, in a short uh, discussion we had the impression that uh, persons like him fit exactly in this kind of uh, meeting. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, it's Germany's first professorship for regulatory science, a field that we had, uh, uh, that we thought is really important uh, 10, 15 years ago, and it's not very good to see that this important scientific discipline is starting to to, to get the shape and, and people. So, um, thank you for the introduction. Can you hear me okay? Good. So, I, I, as um, um, Martin introduced, I met him three weeks ago, and we'd, uh, um, we met at this biomarkers conference, and we, we sat together at the meal, and in the three consecutive weeks, we planned this um, study that I'm, I'm about to present. We've found a PhD student for it who we're supervising together. We found the publication of the paper and we started to talk about the grant application very briefly over lunch. We've also lost one Prime Minister, at least in London. <laughs> so Martin's introduced my role. Um, so I'm going to very quickly do a kind of quickly know the audience thing. So I'm not from the same domain as you and it's quite useful for you to, be, to, to know from a very quick show of hands. Who's been involved in like fetal labour monitoring through like assessments and clinical studies? Please raise your hand. And maybe you should start this from hands up and then take them down. But one or two hands. And then in terms of pro who's been involved in product development? Um, who's been involved in risk assessment within the product development field? I, 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 don't, I mean their product risk assessment. I'll come back to that. But I won't ask the question again. Post market surveillance. Several hands. Clinical evaluation. Good and um, benefit risk analysis would be done. Excellent. So I kind of have a good idea of how to pitch it, and there's at least certain um, enough people that would be interested in the slightly more technical. So I thought, in terms of introducing this further, I start off from the agenda from the session before me, which I thought I would fully miss. I think I caught part of it, which was risk assessment with fetal heart rate monitoring. And what I'm talking about here in risk assessment, which those of you who've been involved in risk assessment, is a different type of risk assessment. It's not actually the risk to the mother, the risk to the child. It's the risk associated with the device that I'm focusing on. Um, um, specifically, it's the, the risk, I'm taking the example of fetal heart rate here, um, with the device compared to um, device X, compared to the um, state of the alternatives to that device, and the state of the art um, for you know, the other competitive devices in the market. And more pre precisely, what I want to talk about is, is a step beyond that, which is not just looking at the risks, it's a regulatory concept which is used in, in regulatory approvals of pharmaceuticals, immunologicals and devices, which is the area of, of um, benefit risk analysis, and that's trying to find some method to measure the global benefits of a technology area or of a drug, and in some way to balance that against the, the global disadvantages of that technology. Um, I'll very quickly introduce the MDR. The MDR may be a controversial um, regulation with some in the audience if you're in the device field. I, I kind of have a nuanced and pragmatic position on the MDR. If the MDR didn't exist, I probably wouldn't have a job, so I have to slightly defend it. I've been to, to, to lots of regulatory conferences recently where I kind of hear not, non-stop negative information about it, so I, I tend to, for my personality, to react a little bit and push back in terms of the positives. I often show the text from the front page and kind of ask who would disagree with it. And I don't think many would actually disagree about high level of protection of health for patients and users for mother and child. Just a little bit of context. Um, for those that don't know what medical device risk analysis is, like I, I borrowed most of these images from, from the internet. Um, you, you have a, a process for your device where you need to set out a risk management plan and you have a series of activities you do um, which are based upon the intended use, intended purpose of your device. You use um, a, Steps, uh, um, a tool for managing risk, FABA, failure mode effect analysis, is, is probably the most popular. You set out, you um, identify risks, risk storming is another approach. It generally approaches in the end, tend to be a panel of experts sitting around discussing these things, in my experience. 
um, and the model that you might theoretically be using slightly, slightly falls to the wayside, it's very pragmatic, you then just develop design risk control measures for your device. These are, you, you put a quantification to this in terms of the occurrence rate of a risk and the severity of a risk and then you look at the, you predict from your control measures of measure if possible from your control measures or your mitigation measures the extent to which you reduce risk. This is then often presented in the form of a risk matrix um, with coloured boxes. These coloured boxes are becoming increasingly controversial as an approach and the very top people in risk management suggest don't use coloured boxes but they're still almost universally used. And what does do risks look like? Like I, I, I set out when writing this slide to describe the risks of a theoretical device in fetal heart rate monitoring. And I've never worked in fetal heart rate monitoring, and this is a very noisy slide, and it could be completely wrong. I, I made these up in about the time it took to type them. I, I used to work in, in the regulatory approval of um, internal pacemakers and internal defibrillators, so I kind of know a bit about the monitoring side, and, and these are the type of risks that one might encounter. So even things like electric shock would be a relevant risk. Um, certainly, um, failure of obtaining a, a, um, a signal, um, a, a signal which is incorrectly processed. We had, um, in some of the previous talks, um, the mention of a, um, a very high false positive rate. Even a very high false positive rate in itself could be linked to a, a, a risk cycle. Is all of this important? It's kind of coming slightly back to this point of um, what is, you know, is AMDR a good thing or a bad thing, or you know, is it a massive labour that's put on um, stopping the innovation for um, society. I've taken the name of the company out here, but I don't know, maybe quite a lot of you have seen this recall that's very, very top of the, at the moment. Um, it's an example of, of where, um, it, you know, from May, um, you know, 28,000, 26,000 reports of, um, of um, um, complaints about devices, 128 deaths, when I recall from the FDA with a, a case where um, polyurethane foams um, um, break down over time and then release into the ventilator and breathe in by patients. This is an example of where quality management system fails or risk analysis fails. There are many, many examples I could have picked. I don't want to overblow these. Um, they don't happen all the time. People do generally aim to um, avoid these things. Just one comment that we have to inform people they should not read the name Phillips here. <laughs> did, did I not take out Phillips? Um, okay. um, it's Phillips on the screen. <laughs> uh, it, I, I try and avoid clicking the company name. So it's, it's a, you, know, you can look up the you search for deep bypass machines and stuff in the media. You know, I, I tend to take the names out because sometimes I work with these companies. And I also think it's unfair because I could have picked you know, Siemens, Phillips, GE, um, Medtronic, any company I previously worked for. There are always examples of failure. And to some extent, picking an example of failure is a little bit unfair. Um, there are certainly examples of work quality management systems and risk management benefit risk are required. So I, I always try and take them out. Um, so that, that covers what risk is. If we talk about what, what benefit, um, clinical benefit is, I always use this picture for clinical benefit. It's actually from Berlin Heart, but I forgot to acknowledge that on the screen. I applied for a job for them once, which I didn't get, but I always kind of quite like them as a company. And they're, they, they kind of have this um, you know, um, e e exceptional use uh, approval from the FDA because they, they manufacture external heart pumps for children. And it's always a very graphical image of what clinical benefit is. You know, children who could, will die if they don't have a heart transplant, the only option on a temporary basis is to have an external pump. Risks may be very, very high, but the clinical benefit is that child can live till they get a transfusion. And it's, I just use that as a pictorial example of clinical benefit. Okay. In terms of MDR, it's just defined as the, the positive impact of um, the device and the health of the individual expressed in terms of a meaningful measure of the patient relevant clinical outcomes, including outcomes related to diagnosis, a, a positive impact on patient management and public health. So that's the actual MDR text. So I think it's kind of quite self-explanatory. In terms of gain, my very quick guesses of what this may be for this area, and I probably would have written this differently if I had ten sessions, but it might be better monitoring of, of fetal safety um, and the ability to inform field risk assessment, the, the prediction of clinical condition. I, I just looked through the, the contents list of the talks and pulled some points out in terms of, of doing this fitness for labour evaluation and through pregnancy monitoring. All of these can be benefits in terms of monitoring and, and normally when we bring it to the, the benefit level, some kind of quantification of lives saved, um, reduced time in hospital, reduced cost to the healthcare system, etc. rather than just the, the name of the area. Um, 
Then we get to the area of um, benefit risk analysis. And I'm going to skip to the next slide. There's this requirement in the legislation that, that, that you do this thing called benefit risk analysis. And I worked in a, in, previously in, in a pacemaker company and I would write clinical evaluation reports for this and it was under the kind of old regulations. And I'll be quite honest about my, my approach to it and the approach of everybody else within the industry. You kind of had a clinical evaluation report and you'd certain set pretext for every device. And I had a section in the end called the benefit risk analysis and it always said the same thing. I've conducted my clinical evaluation. I've described the clinical benefits to the device in section 6.1. I've described um, in detail and quantified the risks in section 6.2. And in this section, I weigh up my, um, as a clinical evaluation, I weigh up my risks and my benefits. And I've come to the conclusion that the um, benefit I weigh to the risk, therefore this device should be um, approved. And that's exactly the same for every single device because there is no actual methodology to compare apples and oranges. Now, I, I'm probably showing, uh, um, maybe to introduce this a, a little bit, um, it's going to be quite a quick introduction because of time, but um, when I discussed this with Martin and some other colleagues at a conference recently, um, we, we discussed some of our in-company experience of doing, of, you know, developing the next step of methods, you know, quantify, quantifying this process which is required under MDR and which notified bodies, so the enforcement authorities have to insist on and are insisting on. We, we discussed that we, we have a number of different approaches. We, we planned this paper, well, Martin will, will describe a beetle monitoring device, um, CTG, um, acronym on there, but, um, and um, I'm exploring various devices I used to work for. And I, I kind of start from the premise that it's not possible to completely compare the risk of a fetal monitoring tool versus its benefit. I really do actually start from the, the concept of um, comparing apples and oranges. Other people within this field have methods which are set out much more as quantum methods where they do really try and set out on a, on a um, same numeric scale. In fact, quantifying a death saved versus a death, a death that occurred. I'm trying to bring together benefit and risk in terms of the same scale. I'm, I'm somewhat skeptical of this. I, I, I give a quote there from uh, the um, Belmont report, which is actually in clinical study risks, setting out this principle from 1978, but I don't think it's actually fundamentally changed. It's, it's, it's not really something that better mathematics necessarily solves. So I mentioned before that um, this, this, these are actually slides from a, par a partner in this project, with myself and Martin, um, where the, the approach was always kind of a little bit, we will weigh things up. Um, very positively. You can try and put some level of um, qualitative estimation on that to say that, that the, your, your little miracle you may experience, so, so Michelle, who, who's the written uh, slide, actually works for a cochlear implant company, so it really is restoring of um, hearing, so it's a, a miracle, versus a, a risk which is theoretically one could die from the surgery from complications of implant and And then one can move a step forward where you actually try and put um, p values onto these and this is you know within the description of your clinical evaluation report you, you report a occurrence rate on a statistical significance but it's always really adding a little bit of objectivity now i'll i'll go through my example of um what i am taking as an approach or i have taken as an approach I, I, i'll be quite honest here that this is before the start of my academic work it's actually stuff that i, I did about four or five years ago working within a company and I know, in no sense, presented as state of the art. Our, our approach in this um, research work that we're doing is actually to present just current uh, current processes used in companies, and actually then to to survey them, to compare them, and then a next study that we will do is to actually propose state of the art methodologies. And we're not quite at that stage yet, so, so I'm, I'm very open to criticism. Um, so, so my approach was to look within the literature to try and find approaches. Um, at that stage, there really weren't any. Um, fully, you know, validated, uh, fully usable approaches. So, so I went to the, 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 the medical literature and other fields and I actually found um, in oncological treatment a, a, a clinical benefit scoring scale and I adapted this in order to draw a, a scale from my own work. And that I took the approach, again, it goes with my apples and oranges, that these are, are effectively non-comparable things, risks and benefits, that it was sensible to actually put just an ordinal scale and to look on the gro global risk of the device. So it's a very clinical evaluation type approach. It's where I've looked at all of the benefits. I've summarized all of those benefits, and I look at those and compare them to this pre-published scale, and I put in the end a, a scale 
based upon this table, which is only on a, on a, on a scale of 1 to 5. I, I, I don't actually know the approaches Martin's using in his company at the moment. They may be much more sophisticated than this, and that will be something we get to later. My approach for risk scale is exactly, it was exactly the same. It was to look for, for formal risk scales for quantifying the overall risk of devices. And um, within this field, I actually found that the orthopedic surgical scales were the most developed, and I actually used the, the, the possum scale as a source to, to base this on. And again, I, I don't expect you to be able to read every point in this slide. The principle is classifying risk as low overall risk, moderate overall risk, major overall risk, and um, major plus overall risk, and giving objective comparison points from surgery. So, for example, a, a major plus overall risk, which probably doesn't apply to people monitoring would be um, equivalent to, a, to a, a surgical procedure with a very high probability of um, a, a complications um, with very severe outcomes, possibly death, um, possibly you know, around a 12 complication rate um, of mortality, I'm sorry, 12% mortality rate, complication rate of 25%. So that's in the very extreme end of medical devices. Of course there are medical devices with complication rates as high as that, perhaps when you get into external pumps for children. Um, completely replacing the circulation, you're getting to some numbers that are sometimes as high with an absolute certain death if those um, systems aren't used. And my, my approach has been to um, determine the ratio by, by taking the ratio of these qualitative measures which have been designed in order to, to take a ratio. It's not sophisticated mathematics, it's a ratio, which is what was asked for. And then to present acceptance criteria within the, the range of these risks. So in describing this, this is a highly say um, semi-quantitative if I was being generous but it's a relatively qualitative framework but with numbers and it fits with my, over, my overall concept with risk assessment I don't know if some of you have done risk assessment um, if you read the ISO norm and if you put it into practice it does require a lot of numbers and quantification my only experience of working with risk assessment for a device is it's more of an instrument that gets people thinking about their device, about how to design it better, about how to relatively compare the level of risks and how to improve over time. I don't ever actually think the numbers that I've seen in any risk assessment. Okay. So I'm, I'm nearly finished. Actually, I'll, I'll briefly present one of the second examples that we'll explore in, in our comparative research paper. And this actually comes from Oticon, the um, French cochlear implant company. But they, they have an ap a approach that I, I saw Michel Hohn, who's their Director of Clinical Evaluation and Studies, present, where they set, to, um, set out in a combined benefit and risk matrix, um, um, which is actually on the next slide, but this is, the, this, is, uh, this, is a, this is actually a benefit matrix, so it's the same as a risk matrix, you, you're likely to have benefit on your y-axis and your benefit ranking on your, um, on your um, it's a little bit like your severity of benefit, your inverted severity of benefit. And uh, the main difference here actually is, 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 to the approach that I use, it's not to look at the overall evaluation of the device, but to actually quantify individual benefits and individual risks, and then to sum up those individual benefits and individual risks rather than a global score. Now I suspect notified bodies might prefer this method, we're not yet in our analysis. I do have some fear that it's probably impossible to fully and describe all of your benefits and, and all of your risks. And then the next logical step, and, and, and Michelle's framework uses this, is then to put your risk and your benefit on the same um, scale. So again, I have so many questions about this. I think it's, um, it's um, intriguing as an approach, but it, we'll, we'll get to it later. Do you, do you use a similar approach, Martin? Or? Okay. And that's for this. We're actually at 20 minutes. I don't know Perfect. Right Perfect timing. Thank, thank you very much. So thanks. Well, one yeah. is, well, whoever wants to bring an innovation in this field on the market in Europe has to go through these things. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's, it's, it's very healthy to have really academic guidance and institutions that deal with this extremely complex process. It's one remark, and the other one is maybe idealistic, but, but as you described your work in, in, the, in the previous company, uh, it, it, one should understand how crazy the system is, that the companies are obliged to come up with their own assessment of the benefit risk ratio because they clearly have a huge conflict of interest. And, and the companies, our company, would love to see independent institutions where you could hand over the data 
and, and, and concepts and whatnot, and they, highly qualified people, should come up with what you've just described, but this is not going to happen. But we should not forget about this, that this is, a, I think, a deep flaw in the entire system, also in the drug problems. Okay, these are my comments. Any other questions? We do have a short coffee break now, so there will be time. And muffins. <laughs> Okay, so then uh, let's thank the speaker again and let's have a good